Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Kansas City Public Library. We're very excited to have you here, to have Robert Hurst here to continue our series of programs uh, having to do with this year's Big Read. He's been with us before. I hope some of you were, were here when uh, uh, he released. He is the, uh, the editor-in-chief, uh, the, the general editor and official curator of the Mark Twain Project and Papers at the University of California at Berkeley. This is the great uh, uh, collected works edition of, uh, of Twain, Twain's works, the academic edition uh, that will someday extend to perhaps 80 volumes. Now that we're in the digital world, volumes may not even mean that much anymore. Uh, it's an enormous uh, project and every reader of, uh, of Twain must be grateful to the 44 years that Robert Hurst has spent uh, doing this. Um, he, he reached an apotheosis of a kind as he released last year uh, the, on the 100th uh, anniversary of Twain's death, um, uh, we, I guess more or less at uh, Twain's request, the, the unexpurgated bio autobiography was kept uh, uh, from the general public uh, for a hundred years because Twain felt that there were things in the unexpurgated biography that might be disturbing, as if his wit was not disturbing of the status quo <laughs> enough anyway. But anyway, when the, when the unexpurgated version of the autobiography was released, Robert Hurst became a media superstar. I have to tell you, I, I saw him on TV two or three times, uh, Good Morning America and places like that, uh, because this was a real publishing phenomenon, and he can tell you more, more about it, but the, the edition of the autobiography, which is a gigantic book, and it's just the first volume, uh, uh, became a huge bestseller. Twain became a bestseller uh, 100 years after his death, uh, and, and, and it's due to the leadership of this great project uh, by Robert Hurst uh, that we're getting these great things from Twain uh, 100 years uh, after uh, his death. Um, he's, he's personally uh, edited a number of volumes. Uh, he's edited a great book of essays that I have called Who is Mark Twain? Uh, some very witty essays uh, uh, about Twain. Uh, he's become, in essence, the, the, uh, the official uh, spokesman about the life and, and works of, of Mark Twain. Uh, and so as we do our great project uh, around uh, Tom Sawyer, uh, it's, it's a real honor to have uh, the man who's at the absolute center of Mark Twain's studies uh, in the world uh, to be here. So please welcome Robert Hurst. As some of you may know, uh, Mark Twain was a very disciplined public speaker, uh, by which I mean he always spoke in relatively brief programs. He was very careful about not speaking too long. He always wanted to leave the audience wanting more rather than wishing he would go home. Um, I'm not such a disciplined speaker, and so I, I bring this with me. This is what I call my anti-too-long uh, device. Uh, it's a kitchen timer. And uh, I try to stop when it goes off. Sometimes I can't stop when it goes off, but you, know, you understand what I'm talking about. <clears throat> in fact, Mark Twain was so um, disciplined in his own speaking that when he was contemplating doing a lecture tour with uh, James Whitcomb Riley, he was afraid that Riley would speak too long, crowd him, and how long he could speak. So he's trying to think about how to introduce them. And he says in his notebook, we don't think he ever used this, but in his notebook he says, uh, I will talk until I am tired, and then Mr. Riley will talk until you are tired. <laughs> we call that the Riley effect, and I'm going to do my best to avoid it tonight. Um, before I get into my written text, I thought I would just remind everybody of what Mark Twain looks like. We tend to think of him only in the white-haired uh, fashion that you see here and here and here. Uh, those and there, of course. Those are all really after 1900. Most of them are 1907, 1907 and 1907. Uh, probably 1908 or 1907 as well, doing the, some of the autobiography. But that's uh, 
Well, that's Mark Twain when he wasn't Mark Twain. That's the earliest known photograph we have of him, actually a daguerreotype. Um, there he is, that's just an enlargement of one of the ones in that collection. And then uh, this includes the only two photographs I know of that are in color. Um, this is another 1907 one. That's back in about 1874 when he's writing Tom Sawyer. And this, of course, is very unusual. <laughs> you do not find too many pictures like that anywhere. Uh, as far as I know, there are no pictures of Henry James with his shirt off. <laughs> there he is on the brand of the New Hampshire house that he used to dictate the autobiography. Uh, it's also important to grasp, I think, that when Mark Twain is close to death, when he's writing the, the autobiography in 1908, he is extremely, extremely famous, um, which is not true when he writes Tom Sawyer. Tom Sawyer is at the very end, very beginning of the career, uh, not the first book, but, but really before he had achieved the kind of fame that he had in 1908. In fact, in a speech in 1908, he announces that he's, he's going to start to collect compliments, the way other people collect books and pipes. He's going to collect compliments. This is the one of the ones he collected. Um, that's his handwriting. He just takes a clipping from a newspaper, that's a pin, and he's pinned it to a paper. And this is, comes from Thomas Edison, whom he knew. Uh, Edison said, an American loves his family. If he has any love left over, for some other person, he generally selects Mark Twain. <laughs> Mark Twain says, I think the world of this great compliment. <laughs> yes, he did. Here's another compliment which he liked. I put a transcription next to the actual handwriting. If you can read the handwriting, which is always very clear. He says he, someone sent this to him from, from Illinois. Could have come from anywhere, including him. But. Uh, little Montana girl's compliment. She was gazing thoughtfully at a photograph of old Mark Twain on a neighbor's mantelpiece. Presently, she said, reverently, we've got a Jesus like that at home, only ours has more trimmings. <laughs> and he explained uh, that what he meant by trimmings, I, in case you've forgotten what Christ looks like, I, I, I pulled one from the family Bible. But he said the difference is, his halo has not arrived yet. It's coming, but he hasn't gotten it yet. That's what she meant by trimmings. So let me try to read this. This is a new talk. I'm using you as guinea pigs. I hope, I hope you won't suffer too much. Mark Twain's mother, Jane Lampton Clemens, gave an interview to the Chicago Interocean in April 1885 when she was 82 and her famous son was about 50 and had just published what would become his masterpiece, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. She recalled, among other things, that she and her husband, John Marshall Clemens, were unable to make young Sam attend the one-room common school in Hannibal, at least not regularly. So, Jane told the reporter, when Sam's father died, which occurred when Sam was 11 years of age, I thought then, if ever, was the proper time to make a lasting impression on the boy and work a change in him. So I took him by the hand and went with him into the room where the coffin was, and in which the father lay. And with it between Sam and me, I said to him that here in this presence, I had some serious requests to make of him, and that I knew his word once given was never broken, for Sam never told a falsehood. He turned his streaming eyes upon me and cried out, Oh, mother, I will do anything, anything you ask of me, except go to school. <laughs> I can't do that. She says, that was the very request I was going to make. Well, we afterwards had a sober talk and I concluded to let him go into a printing office to learn the trade, as I couldn't have him running wild. He did so and has gradually picked up enough education to enable him to do about as well as those who were more studious in early life. We know from the autobiography where Mark Twain discusses and quotes from his eldest daughter Susie's biography of him, she started writing a biography of her father when she was 13, also in 1885. She actually used that interview. Uh, we know from that 
part of the autobiography biography, that the uh, autobiographical nature of Tom Sawyer, of the book, was scarcely a secret in the Clemens household. Susie writes, Clara, that's her younger daughter, her younger sister. Clara and I are sure that Papa played the trick on Grandma about the whipping that is related in Adventures of Tom Sawyer. That's a reference to the opening paragraphs. And, Susie continued, we know Papa played hooky all the time. And how readily would Papa pretend to be dying so as not to have to go to school. And of course, just about any reader of Tom Sawyer will remember the preface where Mark Twain tells us that most of the adventures recorded in this book really occurred. One or two were experiences of mine, the rest those of boys who were schoolmates of mine. Huck Finn was drawn from life. We know Tom Blankenship is the model for Huck Finn. Tom Sawyer also, but not from an individual. He is a combination of the characteristics of three boys whom I knew, and therefore belongs to the composite order of architecture. Generations of scholars have proved that, in fact, more than one or two of Tom's experiences are based literally on Sam Clemens's experiences. And it's fair to say that almost all of them are really his experiences, not those of the other boys. Whitewashing the fence in front of the family home. Feeding Peter the cat a dose of painkiller. And, of course, Tom's preference for swimming in Bear Creek and in the Mississippi instead of going to school. It has recently been shown, in fact, that even the so-called puppy love theme of the story is based directly on Clemens's own experiences in courting Olivia Langdon in 1868 and 1869. In short, many of the incidents in Tom Sawyer encourage the reader to believe that in one way or another, these experiences happen to the author, and that the story he or she is reading is indeed a fictional rendering of real events. Of course, we always know that it is a story, that is to say, it's made up in a certain basic sense. But Tom Sawyer is at bottom Sam Clemens, or at least an aspect of him, something it has long been unfashionable to say in academia, but I'm quite willing to say. At the time, the publication, 1876, when this book came out, the story would have been called, and was called, realistic, realistic. And the Atlantic Monthly Review that William Dean Howells, Mark Twain's good friend and literary advisor, published in May 1876, he said in part that Mark Twain had taken the boy of the Southwest for the hero of his new book and has presented him with a fidelity to circumstance which, no, which loses no charm by being realistic in the highest degree and which gives incomparably the best picture of life in that region as yet known to fiction. I'm not sure a modern audience would call it realistic, but I think it's important to grasp that from Mark Twain's point of view and from Howells's point of view, it is realistic. It's more realistic than the fiction that they're used to. So what relevance does all this have to the cross-generational appeal of Tom Sawyer? Really, cross-generational is some $9 words to mean uh, it appeals to kids and to adults. I mean, cross-generational is... We, we thought that title up before we wrote the text. Why, in plain words, does the story appeal to young people and to their parents, and not just in the 1870s and 1880s, but still in 2011, assuming for the moment that it does appeal to you? For starters, and because I don't believe I've ever heard anyone say this out loud, isn't it obvious why any story that represents going to school and to church or Sunday school as a kind of wearying, mindless burden would appeal to young people who are themselves forced to go to school, and if not, to Sunday school? Isn't it obvious that all of our sympathies in reading the story are on the side of the children, not on the side of the parents and the teachers and judges and ministers who, in one way or another, oblige the children to go to school and to church and who punish them for both real and imagined misbehavior? This bias in favor of young people is so obvious to me that it becomes somewhat puzzling why this book has become, in U.S. schools, the most widely and frequently assigned American literature text from about the sixth grade up. Virtually everyone has to read it for school or suffer the consequences. <laughs> Just as in Tom Sawyer. In fact, one of the most amazing things about Tom Sawyer, it seems to me, is that it has survived this assault of adult and parental approval. It's still fun to read, even though reading it often now falls into the category of work, which the author so clearly defines in the opening chapters. Work consists of whatever a body is obliged to do. Play consists of whatever a body is not obliged to do. 
The frequency with which adults oblige youngsters to read it, including the creation of nationwide events like the Big Read, <laughs> suggests that somehow or other, Mark Twain's story also appeals to adults, and not just because they too were once children. For some reason, they think of the book as a good thing for their children to read. It is this cross-generational appeal that I'm trying to explain to myself as much as to you. Let me begin a little bit with some facts and figures and some uh, pictures. That is the first edition. A little bit distorted, but it's a fairly good representation of it. Um, Mark Twain's story has a remarkable history of publication and republication. Um, it's 135 years since he published, first published it. It has never, never been out of print. That's a remarkable fact. In any case, uh, at the time, you know, he publishes it in 1876. Uh, he sells it in this blue cloth, and they have various other bindings, which I didn't copy for you. They sell for $2.75, $3.25, and $4.25. Those are very expensive prices for a book. Uh, if you bought a copy of Henry James's Golden Bowl, you would get it in a bookstore and it would cost you 75 cents. So Mark Twain is uh, selling very expensive books um, and making comparably more money from them. But in the first year of publication, from December to December 1877, it sold only 24,000 copies. For Mark Twain, that was a disastrously low figure. By comparison, The Innocents Abroad, his first big book and bestseller, published seven years earlier, had sold almost three times as many copies in its first year. And Roughing It, in its first year, the second big book that he publishes and that is popular, uh, sold almost 70,000 copies in its first year. After eight years, each of those books sold respectively 100,000 and 90,000 copies total. So you can see that 24,000 copies from Mark Twain's point of view is, is starting slow, as it were. And we actually don't have good figures for the total amount, but a fair guess is that by the time Mark Twain dies in 1910, uh, at least a million copies of Tom Sawyer have been sold, including uh, the ones that I've represented here. That's, that's just the title page. You can see what Tom looks like. Uh, I don't know if you are aware that, that all of Mark Twain's books were illustri illustrated, including Tom Sawyer. Uh, I've represented a few of these in here in case you don't have a copy that has the illustrations in it. Um, the only way to recognize Tom is uh, he has these check pants. Um, that's the first edition title page, but then here's uh, an English edition, which is under, you know, he controls it, he gets income from it. Here's an example, this is the, an ad for the American Publishing Company that basically tells you how these books were offered, what kinds of bindings. You can see that that's the most expensive kind of binding. Uh, why did it only sell uh, 24,000 copies? Well, unfortunately, the Canadians, books, book publishers named Belford Brothers in Toronto, uh, pirated the book. They actually got hold of of, of proofs and uh, published their version of it before Mark Twain published his. Uh, and because of the way the copyright laws in this country were written, there was no way to prevent them from importing these pirated copies and selling them in the United States. And since they sold for considerably less than the prices that Mark Twain offered his book at, the market was basically destroyed um, by this piracy. Um, Mark Twain, for the rest of his career, is very interested in copyright uh, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Uh, you may not be aware that in, not until 1891 did this country have a, an international copyright law. So there was no way, easy way for him to prevent um, the Belford brothers from doing what they did. In any case, by the time uh, Mark Twain dies, as I said, there were at least a million copies in print, and I would say that by now, um, there are probably three million copies in print. I count 17, 17 individual separate editions of Tom Sawyer that you can buy 
in any bookstore. That's because there's no copyright on it after 1924. Uh, and it has been translated into every language that you can think of and probably some languages you can't think of, like Urdu. It's an amazing fact that this is so widely distributed and so widely known. You see, I wanted to begin with these just so you get a, a grasp of what it is that you're looking at when you're reading Tom Sawyer. Um, and also just to make the point that because it's been so widely read, here's some more versions of it. That's a German edition that he does license. And that's the second edition published in 1892, just before he himself went bankrupt. Um, there he is in 1873, in one of the years that he's writing Tom Sawyer. And the next picture is a picture of him in 1874 in the little study, uh, octagonal study that his sister-in-law built for him in Elmira, sort of up the hill in Elmira so that you could go up there, open the windows, and have cool breeze. There were no such things as air conditioners at the time. And we know that much of Tom Sawyer was written there. In any case, I started to say that I didn't want you to be too disappointed, so I'm going to hedge my bets a bit and say that, you know, it's been around for 135 years, so the likelihood that I have anything new to say about it is uh, vanishingly small. <laughs> At least anything new that's also true. I mean, English professors say new things all the time. They just don't happen to be true. <laughs> but I'm going to try to uh, give you something a little bit newer than, than, uh, than I ordinarily think I can. I, I drew up this genealogical chart because my students, um, who I forced to read Tom Sawyer and other things by Mark Twain, um, can't understand what the family relationship is. Uh, this is not a central core family, obviously, with the father and the mother and sons and daughters. It is a kind of exploded family. That is to say, none of the fathers are around. Okay? But Mark Twain has thought this through. Um, Sid Sawyer has the same last name as Tom, but they're not brothers. They're half-brothers, which means that um, Sid is the product of the second marriage by this Mr. Sawyer, whom we never meet, of course. Um, and Mary is uh, not a sister, uh, but rather the, the daughter of Aunt Polly and therefore Tom's cousin. Right? And although you haven't read it recently, Huck Finn has Aunt Sally and Silas Phelps down in Arkansas. So th th this has all been thought out very carefully uh, so that the standing of Tom is well understood if you pay attention. He is, although it rarely says this, you rarely see anybody talking about this, Tom is an orphan. Tom is an orphan. And so is Sid, for that matter. Now, Mark Twain loved talking about orphans, but also it was a generic requirement of what's called a bad boy story, which is what Tom Sawyer is, fundamentally. You start with orphans. And there are many consequences of this, which I probably haven't got time to go into. Uh, Mark Twain liked talking about orphans. Uh, this is an answer to a letter he got asking him to give money to an orphanage. I beg to wish the best success and a long career of usefulness to the infant asylum. But words are empty. Deeds are what show the earnest spirit. Therefore, I am willing to be one of a thousand citizens who shall agree to contribute two or more of their children to this enterprise. <laughs> now, just so you don't think that Mark Twain is cheap, he knows full well what they will do with this. That's why he, write, he signs it, double signature. That's what all the autograph hunters wanted, Samuel Clemens and Mark Twain. He knows what they'll do with it. They'll sell it. And they do sell it for $200, which is probably why it still survives. Well, that's just a digression. Uh, Mark Twain was not, um, by nature, and temperament, let alone by training and practice, a novelist. Even though we tend to think of him as a novelist, partly because his one truly successful novel, Huckleberry Finn, utterly changed the way novels were written. Hemingway tells you that, and a lot of other people tell you that. But Mark Twain was basically not 
that kind of writer. Uh, and in fact, the kinds of novels that he tended to undertake were novels more or less in the, in the genre that, that, let's say, Defoe um, wrote. Not in the genre, let's say, that Richardson wrote. They don't have an arc of you know, rising interest and declining interest the way uh, Pamela does or, or Clarissa. Um, Huck Finn is an exception to that. He does have that arc. But most of Mark Twain's novels are serial. They are, they are takeoffs on the kind of thing that the Defoe did. Um, basically a series of events, one thing happening after another, without any planning or any expectation, long-term expectation of what's going to happen. You're not worried about what's going to happen to Tom Sawyer. That's not why you're reading it. You just want to know what happens next. That's the kind of novel that he could do, that he could manage. In fact, Mark Twain says this about himself uh, in 1890, uh, when he's looking back on, or he's, he's writing the tragedy of Puddinghead Wilson. He says he's a jack-legged novelist. That means he's a, an amateur, uh, really um, someone who doesn't do this in a professional way. Mark Twain is very rarely guilty of false modesty, so I tend to take that seriously. In any case, Tom Sawyer was his very first novel, his very, his very first attempt to write a, an extended fiction. Uh, I'm leaving out the partnership novel that he wrote with Charles Lee Warner because he doesn't really write the whole of that. He only writes about half of that. And he certainly isn't in charge of the plot. Uh, and I would say that Tom Sawyer shows all the marks of a maiden effort. It was co composed in much the way that Mark Twain's known to have composed almost all of his long works. It's improvised from start to finish. It's without a plot. It's done without a plot or an outline even. And its composition is broken into three separate stints. Uh, I should, should say that's just an enlargement of what you saw earlier. That's Mark Twain. That's the earliest fig figure we have of Mark Twain. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about the illustrations before I get into this, this last point, just since I'm not sure you'll have seen them. Um, that's Aunt Polly. That's the beginning scene, right? He's climbing over the fence. Here's Huckleberry with his dead cat and Becky Thatcher. Now, these were all drawn by a man named True Williams, uh, who Mark Twain regarded as something of a genius. You may not think of them as works of genius. Here's another example. This is Peter and the cat. Peter leaving, uh, being dosed with a with, uh, painkiller. Um, the pirates set sail for Jackson's Island. And I think the one illustration in the book that almost certainly Mark Twain drew himself, the house and man that Tom draws for Becky. Uh, here's Sid, and here's Mary. I thought you might like to see who the real Sid and Mary are. Clemens tells us that, that Sid is Henry, his younger brother, Henry, who dies quite young in a steamboat accident. I never knew Henry to do a vicious thing toward me or toward anyone else, but he frequently did righteous ones that cost me as heavily. <laughs> it was his duty to report me when I needed reporting and neglected to do it myself. And he was very faithful in discharging that duty. <laughs> he is Sid in Tom Sawyer, but Sid was not Henry. Henry was a very much finer and better boy than ever Sid was. Uh, he goes on to say that it was, it was Henry who spotted the different color thread in the collar that that uh, he puts back on himself after going swimming. Uh, this is uh, Mark Twain's older sister, Pamela. Uh, this is a, a portrait probably about the time that, that um, Mark Twain is, is thinking of in the late 40s. And here she is really in the 1870s. And this is, of course, Aunt Polly. Uh, and toward the end, there's a little joke in the illustrations. Uh, someone puts in a picture of B.P. Shillaber's Mrs. Partington, who is also a widow and also has a son named Mike, um, and who had many similarities with the real Aunt Polly, that is, with Jane Clemens. Um, 
and that's Jane. Uh, also a portrait probably about the time that he's thinking of, uh, and about the time re really of that interview I started with. Lovely. Mark Twain loved his mother dearly and never stopped kidding her. Oh dear. Well, since I was giving you before and after pictures, I thought I... <laughs> That's what happens when you get at Mark Twain, you know. As I say, this, uh, this story is written in uh, bursts. That is to say, he doesn't sit down and just dash it off in one big um, stint. There are actually two stints, three stints. One only a couple months long, one about six months long and one about four months long, right? And they're separated by fairly long periods of time. Here, I think 14 months and eight months here. Um, at, the, um, at the end of this one, Mark Twain writes to a friend, a guy named Brown, John Brown, um, and says he'd been writing 50 pages of manuscript a day on average, as on Tom Sawyer for some time now on a book, a story, and consequently have been so wrapped up in it and so dead to everything else that I have fallen mighty short in letter writing. But night before last, I discovered that that day's chapter was a failure in conception, morals, truth to nature, and execution, enough blemishes to impair the excellence of almost any chapter. And so I must burn up the day's work and do it all over again. It was plain that I had worked myself out, pumped myself dry, so I knocked off and went to playing billiards for a change, his favorite game. I haven't had an idea or a fancy for two days now. We now know that he had reached manuscript page 500 of what became chapter 18, and on the back of that page he wrote, condemn rest of chapter, and he must have burned what followed from that. And he didn't take up the story until May of 1875 again. Uh, this interruption, proved to be a signal moment for Mark Twain, who was still very much in the learning process of how to write long narratives. In his autobiographical dictation of 30 August 1906, he remembered it this way. It was by accident that I found out that a book is pretty sure to get tired along about the middle and refuse to go on with its work until its powers and its interests should have been refreshed by a rest and its depleted stock of raw materials reinforced by lapse of time. It was when I reached the middle of Tom Sawyer that I made this invaluable find. At page 400, he actually means 500. At page 400 of my manuscript, the story made a sudden and determined halt and refused to proceed another step. Day after day, it still refused. I was disappointed, distressed, and immeasurably astonished. For I knew quite well that the tale was not finished, and I could not understand why I was not able to go on with it. The reason was very simple. My tank had run dry. It was empty. The stock of materials in it was exhausted. The story could not go on without materials. It could not be wrought out of nothing. He's talking about things that he remembers from his boyhood that he can weave into the story. He's run out of them, he says. That's why I couldn't go on. When the manuscript had lain in a pigeonhole two years, I took it out one day and read the last chapter that I had written. It was then that I made the great discovery that when the tank runs dry, You've only to leave it alone and it will fill up again in time while you are asleep. Also, while you are at work at other things and are quite unaware that this unconscious and profitable cerebration is going on. There was plenty of material now and the book went on and finished itself without any trouble. Now, he exaggerates uh, this period. He says two years. It wouldn't take him two years to get back to it, but it was a long time. The interruption at page 500 occurred, as I said, in September of 1874, and Mark Twain resumed work not until the next year. And really by the, by the end of July, or rather the beginning of July, he was done. Just a few weeks earlier, he had written to his friend William Dean Howells, who had seen the manuscript, incomplete manuscript, um, when he made a visit to Hartford in June. Thank you so much for the praises you give the story. I am going to take into serious consideration all you have said and then make up my mind by and by. Since there is no plot to the thing, I have to take this seriously, no plot, it is likely to follow its own drift 
and so is as likely to drift into manhood as anywhere. I won't interpose. See, even in 1906, he's thinking of this as a story that writes itself, but also in 1875. Uh, what does he mean by drift into boyhood? This is the first page of the manuscript, which is at Georgetown, the whole manuscript. And up here you can see what amounts to an outline. Um, I don't think you can read that. He's canceled it, but I, I, I tried to blow it up and, and transcribe it for you. This is as close as Mark Twain gets to planning this story. Number one, boyhood and youth. Two, youth and early manhood. Three, the battle of life in many lands. Four, age 37 to 40, return and meet grown babies and toothless old drivelers who were the grandees of his boyhood. <laughs> then down here, the adored unknown, that would be Becky. The adored unknown, a worn, faded old maid and full of rasping puritanical vinegar piety. <laughs> I love that outline. That's what he means when he says, I, I decided against taking him into boyhood. He decides to stop, really, with his boyhood. And on July 5th, he acknowledges, as I say, that there's no plot, um, and finishes it. He says, I have finished the story. I'll get to this in a second. I finished the story and didn't take the chap beyond boyhood. I believe it would be fatal to do so, in any shape but autobiographically, like Gilles Blas, a picaresque novel. I perhaps made a mistake in not writing it in the first person. It's a very interesting observation because, of course, the next book that he writes is Huckleberry Finn, which is in the first person. If I went on now and took him into manhood, that is Tom, he would be, just be like all the one-horse men in literature, and the reader would conceive a hearty contempt for him. It is not a boy's book at all. It will only be read by adults. It is only written for adults. Very emphatic. But of course, when Howells reads the final manuscript, which is just a few months later, he takes the opposite view. Even though he praises it at great length. In November 1875, he says, I have finished Tom Sawyer, reading Tom Sawyer a week ago, sitting up till 1 a.m., to get to the end, simply because it, is, it was impossible to leave off. It's altogether the best boy story I ever read. It will be an immense success, but I think you ought to treat it explicitly as a boy story. Grown-ups will enjoy it just as much if you do, and if you should put it forth as a study of boy character from the grown-up point of view, you'd give the wrong key to it. So, when Mark Twain reads the manuscript, that Howells has returned to him. Howells has made some suggestions in the margin, very, very uh, tentative suggestions in pencil, but he always did this kind of thing. Uh, when he gets it back, he goes through and finds all of Howells' suggestions and adopts virtually every one of them. In fact, he winds up adopting Howells' point of view that it is a boy's story, not something that's just going to be read by adults, but a boy's story. This agreement is expressed, by the way, as it were, when Mark Twain reports his acceptance of Howell's suggestions. Um, he says, I finally concluded to cut the Sunday school speech down to the first two sentences, leaving no suggestion of satire, since the book is to be for boys and girls. I'm always grateful that he managed to expand his view to including the other sex as well. Boys really is just a kind of marker for young people. Um, I tamed the various obscenities until I judged that they no longer carried offense. It's very striking to me, at least, uh, I find it striking, I should say, that, the, that Mark Twain could get all the way through some 900 pages of manuscript without A, deciding to end the story where he does, rather than carry it, as the outline suggests, into the boy's later years, and B, that he could clearly not quite decide at that late date whether it would be, as he says, only read by adults, or was in fact a book for boys and girls. On this latter question, the evidence suggests that he wrote much of the book having adults in mind as his primary, if not only, audience. 
Since so many of the funniest parts seem to be outside the normal grasp, at least they seem to me to be outside the normal grasp of young people. Young people keep changing, of course. But in fact, the keynote of what you might call the adult parts is always either satire, which he says he's taken out for the boys and girls, or nostalgia. Those are two things that are offered to us as adults. And they are literary modes which I think it's obvious are really not well appreciated by the young. They're not old enough to be nostalgic. Uh, and many of them uh, don't understand that something's being made fun of. They think it's just fun to hear about. For example, Tom's embarrassed situation in chapter four when asked by the judge to name the first two disciples, <laughs> David and Goliath, is not the right answer. <laughs> not the right answer. My students don't even know what the right answer is. They've forgotten who the disciples are. Another example is the narrator's description, which I've put up here in the, in the manuscript, so, so you can see what it looks like. Um, description of the minister's sermon, which droned along monotonously through an argument that was so prosy that many a head by and by began to nod. And yet it was an argument that dealt in limitless fire and brimstone and thinned the predestined elect down to a company so small as to be hardly worth the saving. <laughs> you see, that is not what Jonathan Edwards had in mind when he talked about the predestined elect and its being a very small group. Um, the idea that they wouldn't be worth saving is a very adult joke, and I dare say it goes right by any younger reader. Most younger readers don't even really know what predestined elect means. I'm not sure I do. Never mind. But I'd like to suggest that his audience, really, despite this kind of hesitation at the end, his audience was really both throughout. Really both. Uh, whether or not he fully recognized it. After all, he's only talking about what the, what the preponderance of the audience is going to be when he says it's an adult or he says it's for children. Um, and I would cite as a general principle the, what I call, uh, trespassers W. Gambit, which takes its name, I've given it that name, from A.A. A. Milne's stories of Christopher Robin, Pooh, Piglet, and others. The gambit is simply that the characters in the story, including the young boy Christopher, do not understand what an old decaying wooden sign near Piglet's tree home saying, Trespassers W, you see it, means. And are, they're all therefore incapable of refuting Piglet's explanation as an inspired explanation. Uh, he says it's an old family name and that it stands for Trespasser's Will, which is short for Trespasser's William, because his grandfather had two names in case he might lose one. <laughs> the adult reader, on the other hand, knows full well what the sign really means, knows that basically it's uh, a keep-off sign. Um, and th the result is that the adult reading this story, Pooh or Tom, to his children, has a joke for himself that his, his young person doesn't get. It's a kind of reward, I suppose, for reading a story to your kids. In any case, I would say that, that uh, Tom Sawyer is shot through with this kind of double um, joke, jokes that are not clearly going to be gotten by, <clears throat> by everyone, only by the adults. I mean, if only think about Tom's fear that, you know, if he laughs or if he, swat, if he grabs a fly in church that uh, he will, his soul will be instantly destroyed. I suppose that is what a young Protestant Presbyterian youngster would think, but of course, I think we know better. Even now, we know better. Another way to grasp this problem of adult versus young people and uh, to see how Mark Twain gradually dealt with it is to look at the sorts of changes that text to the text that Howells suggested, and why. It is, after all, Howells who was, first and last, clearest on the idea that the story is primarily for youngsters. And many of his proposed changes are aimed precisely at eliminating what he calls too strong milk for babes. Uh, whether or not they are too strong milk for adults didn't matter. If you were aiming at kids, you had to kind of observe the proprieties in a way that you didn't for adults. 
Mark Twain gratefully accepted all of Howells' suggestions, and I've tried to illustrate the way he handled some of them. Uh, if these slides were in color, you could see that this ink here is a different color from the main, the, the, the whole text. And it shows basically that Mark Twain has to have made them in retrospect. You know, he comes back to it and makes the changes. Uh, this is the description of the poodle who sits down on a so-called pinch bug. Originally, Mark Twain writes, he sits down and went sailing up the aisle with his tail shut down like a hasp. And Howells says, awfully good, but a little too dirty. That goes right by most of us because we don't remember what a hasp is. <laughs> this is a hasp, right? And you shut it down by pushing it into that hole. Or in this, of a trunk, you push it down, you shut it. So it can, now do you understand what, what it, a tail shut down like, he's got it, I mean, Williams has got the tail correctly drawn, right? Um, most of us, I think, would not have reacted that way to it. We would have liked it to stay. Mark Twain actually goes on and, and creates, uh, uh, deletes this one too, fiercely expressing at one end the woe that was torturing the other. You can't speak of the dog's end, apparently. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, I'm being clear about this notion of propriety, but let me give you an example. When Mark Twain writes a story called Tom Sawyer Abroad in 1894, he's learned a lot from what he did uh, on this story, and he's actually writing it specifically for children. And he's planning on publishing it in St. Nicholas, which he knows will censor it, but he's also, he will collect it and publish it uh, uncensored. And his favorite illustrator, Dan Beard, is hired to do the illustrations for it. And he reports that Mary Mapes Dodge, the editor of this magazine, in addition to censoring the text, required that he go back to his drawings and put shoes on Tom and Huck and Jim. Shoes. They aren't to appear barefoot. This is a kind of propriety which, uh, in the age of the internet, we've lost touch with. <laughs> Thank God. One more, or two more. Uh, Howells says, I don't like the slops incident at all. What's the slops incident? You probably don't know because, of course, Mark Twain takes out the word slops. Um, but it occurs uh, early on, I think it's chapter three, um, where Tom is mooning after Becky. In the original version, Tom is lying on the ground beneath her window, disposing himself upon his back with his hands clasped upon his breast and holding his poor wilted flower, the flower that she's tossed him. And thus he would die out in the cold world with no shelter over his homeless head, no friendly hand to wipe the death damps from his brow, no loving face to bend pityingly over him when the great agony came. And thus she would see him when she looked out upon the glad morning. And oh, would she drop one little tear upon his lifeless form? Would she heave one little sigh to see a bright young life so rudely blighted, so untimely cut down? The window went up, a maid servant's discordant voice profaned the holy calm, and a deluge of foul slops drenched the prone martyr's remains. That's, um, Howells doesn't like that. So Mark Twain changes foul slops to water, and instead of those garments reeking, as they certainly would if they had been doused with a chamber pot, um, they are simply drenched. That's how it looks in the, in the book itself. Uh, you see, True Williams is actually reading the, t the text without that change in place. So he's, you know, he draws a chamber pot. <laughs> if you're alert, you, you notice that. I mean, if you think about it, what, why would the maid be dumping a jug of water out the window? No reason. But chamber pot, yes. <laughs> but perhaps the most interesting uh, of these changes occurs in this chapter 22, or 20. It has to do with the schoolmaster's secret book, which uh, True Williams has portrayed for you there, with the terror in it. 
This occurs, as you remember, when Becky sneaks a look at the book, which is usually kept in the locked desk drawer, but it's left out carelessly, so she looks at it. Uh, and Howells comments on this, too. He says, I should be afraid of this picture incident. I should be afraid of it, meaning it goes too far. It's a little bit too risque. Becky opens on, this is, this is uh, the introduction to the, the text. Becky opens the book and finds that the title page, Professor Somebody's Anatomy, carried no information to her mind. So she began to turn the leaves. She came at once upon a handsomely engraved and colored frontispiece, a human figure, stark naked. At that moment, a shadow fell on the page and Tom Sawyer stepped in at the door and caught a glimpse of the picture. Becky snatched at the book to close it and had the hard luck to tear the pictured page half down the middle. She thrust the volume into the desk, turned the key, and burst out crying with shame and vexation. Tom Sawyer, you are just as mean as you can be to sneak up on a person and look at what they are looking at. <laughs> this is the kind of drawing that you... Uh, would find in an anatomy. Um, it is not, however, I'm pretty sure, the drawing that Mark Twain has in mind. In fact, I could not find an anatomy with a colored, engraved picture of the human body. In fact, well into the 30s, uh, dictionaries carry this kind of um, drawing, which of course is either, well, we're not sure whether it's male or female. It's supposed to be male, but it doesn't look very male, does it? This is the manuscript that I'm focusing on. This is, this is what Howells, I mean, this is what Clemens does in response to Howells's change. I'll try to explain, this is, again, the original, this is an attempt to kind of transcribe it so you can read that if it's a little easier. How could I know you was looking, how could I know it wasn't a nice book? He says originally. I didn't know girls ever, dash, and he interrupts himself. That's gotta go. It's not a nice book. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, Tom Sawyer. You know you're going to tell on me. Originally, you know very well. I didn't know what sort of a book, Dash. Oh, what shall I do, what shall I do? I'll be whipped, and I never was whipped in school. And down here, but that ain't anything. It ain't half. You'll tell everybody about the picture, about the picture. And oh, 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 and she stamped her little foot and said, be so mean if you want to. I know something that's going to happen. She's talking about the ink poured on his spelling book. You just wait and see, you'll see. Hateful, hateful, hateful. And she flung out of the house with a new explosion of crying. Tom stood still, rather flustered by this onslaught. Presently he said to himself, what a curious kind of a fool a girl is. Never been licked in school. Humph, <laughs> shucks, what's a licking? That's just like a girl. They're so thin-skinned and chicken-hearted. But then the part that's crossed out is what I'm getting to. But that picture is, is, well, it ain't so curious she feels bad about that. No, no, I reckon it ain't. Suppose she was Mary, and Alf Temple, had, Mary would be his cousin. Suppose she would marry, and Alf Temple had caught her looking at such a picture as that and went around telling. She'd feel mighty bad. She'd feel, well, I'd lick him. I bet I would. Of course, I ain't going to tell old Dobbins on this little fool because there's other ways of getting even. Um, it's too mean. It would be too mean to tell Dobbins about her seeing, uh, being involved in the picture. I think what's remarkable about this is that the passage as originally written is clearly meant to tell you not that Becky is upset that she's going to be whipped in public for the first time in school, it's that you have seen this naked figure. According to the mores of the time, which I suppose we're equally hard-pressed to recall, Becky's character will have been compromised by having seen such a picture. Hard to believe, isn't it? Now there. <laughs> Keep going. I have to say that I regret Mark Twain did this to his text. He did so, I think, really, because he was pretty sure he wanted this to be read by young people and not just old people. These changes are, of course, all imposed on the text after he'd finished it. 
so they are second thoughts about what will fly and what won't fly. Um, but I think I, I'm going to end with this example, that Mark Twain actually had a fairly devious way of dealing with a book in, that, that made it acceptable to children in a way that, that I think most people haven't noticed. You recall that, that, that Tom is always uh, an area he feels wronged in love or when he thinks that Aunt Polly has uh, falsely accused him, he's always full of very articulate self-pity. The boy's pulse soul was steeped in melancholy. His feelings were in happy accord with his surroundings. He sat long with his elbows on his knees and his chin in his hands meditating. It seemed to him that life was but a trouble at best and he more than half envied Jimmy Hodges so lately released, dead. It must be very peaceful, he thought, to lie and slumber and dream forever and ever with the wind whispering through the trees and caressing the glass and flowers, etc. If only he had a clean Sunday school record he could be willing to go as to die and be done with it all. Now as to that girl, what had he done? Nothing. He had meant the best in the world and had been treated like a dog, like a very dog. She would be sorry someday when it was too late. Ah, uh, if he could only die temporarily. <laughs> now there's a similar passage in chapter 3 when he's talking about Aunt Polly. Tom, Tom sulked in the corner and exalted his woes. He knew that in her heart his aunt was on her knees to him, etc. He pictured himself lying sick unto death and his aunt bending over him, beseeching one little forgiving word, but he would turn his face to the wall and die without that word unsaid. Ah, uh, how would she feel then? And he pictured himself brought home from the river, dead, with his curls all wet and his poor hands still forever and his sore heart at rest. He does this so well how she would throw herself upon him and how her tears would fall like rain and her lips pray God to give her back her boy. She would never, never abuse him anymore. But he would lie there thinking he's, he's dead, but he's going to still maintain the silence. He would lie there cold and white and make no sign, a poor little sufferer whose griefs were at an end. He so worked upon his feelings with the pathos of these dreams that he had to keep swallowing. He's crying, you know. He was so like to choke and his eyes swam in a blur of water, which overflowed when he winked and ran down and trickled from the end of his nose. And such a luxury to him was this petting of his sours that he could not bear to have any worldly interference. He goes out to the river, sits on the edge of a, of a raft, contemplates this same thing, the vast dreamy stream, wishing the while that he could only be drowned all at once and unconsciously without undergoing the uncomfortably routine devised by nature. I don't think there's any question where Mark Twain's sympathies are here. He hates this kind of false sentiment. He hates this kind of self-pity, and he's having good fun making, uh, making fun of Tom. Now, I think th th I'm going to make this brief so that you can all ask me questions, but what I wanted to say was that Mark Twain sneaks into this story a gratification of this kind of wish thinking, wishful thinking. The kids do attend their own funeral. They come back from Jackson's Island and get to hear what all the adults say of how wonderful they were and how this and that. I mean, it's a little bit of a satire on the adults, but it's also payback for this. In other words, we get to make fun of this sort of uh, sentiment, but then we quietly indulge in it at the same time. If you think about it, the same gambit is played uh, with treasure. You know, Mark Twain talks about they're looking for treasure when they're out on Jackson Island, but then when he gets to chapter 25, he says, basically, this is a, you know, something that all boys have to do. They have to go look for treasure, and then, you, if you recall, they have wonderful ways of locating where they're going to dig, none of which, of course, works. But, of course, again, a secret gratification of this empire, I mean, this enterprise, they do find treasure, $10,000 worth. Um, that's a way in which Mark Twain is basically appealing to his youthful audience without giving up his satire. And I think um, I should give it up now and let you ask me questions. Thank you all for coming.